Welcome to part six of this series on in situ compressive strength assessment. This time we're going to be dealing with a new method developed by RILEM Technical Committee 249 ISC. This is the last of the methods we'll be dealing with and I'm particularly interested in explaining what it's all about. Many engineers are interested in knowing the compressive strength of existing structures and this is something that is not well covered by the major standards. A new approach that deals particularly with existing structures was developed by the RILEM TC249 ISC committee and I myself was a participant in this committee. The aim was to provide a practical method to give a compressive strength estimate on existing structures with an adequate precision using the lowest number of core test results. The new guideline differs from the standards in three important areas. First of all, it deals with the existing structures rather than looking at concrete compliance in new structures. It estimates the mean strength with a specified quality level rather than estimating the characteristic compressive strength. And when it comes to estimating strength at a particular location, whereas the standards give a fifth percentile strength, the Rylem method gives an estimation of the local strength with a specified tolerance. And here we can see the workflow. First of all, we have to specify the quality of the estimation. Then we have to collect the data. We have to identify the conversion model. And finally, we do the strength estimation. If we look at this in more detail, we'll see some new concepts here. First of all, we have to define how good an estimate we would like to have. The second point is we have to check how good is the quality of the non-destructive testing. Thirdly, we have to use conditional coring, which is something we've looked at in AN13791. And finally, we have to look at how good is the model for the strength estimation. So the first key concept is the estimation quality level. In other words, how good does the strength estimation need to be? And there are three levels, from the lowest EQL1 to the highest EQL3. And we define maximum errors allowed for the estimation of the mean strength for a test region and for a maximum error on the strength estimation at any particular location. The second new key concept is called test result precision, and it's something that the standards don't deal with at all. The precision of the test data has a major effect on the uncertainty of the strength estimates. So the Ryland method defines a procedure to check the test result precision based on carrying out a number of tests at the same test location. And we have to calculate the coefficient of variation and the standard deviation. It requires very little additional effort and brings a lot of value. Let's look at an example to see how easy the procedure is. I'm using an EN13791 test location, which is specified as 30 by 30 centimeters. If I'm doing a rebound hammer test, I have to do nine impacts and each impact should be 25 millimeters apart. So one rebound test takes up this amount of space. And there I have my first result and I can have room in the same test locations to do more tests. Then I have to calculate the average. I have to calculate the standard deviation and I divide one by the other to get the coefficient of variation. I have to repeat this procedure at a number of test locations between two and five are recommended. And I, in this case, I've done it at four locations. The next step is to check the results against the table. And I can see the two of my results give a medium precision. Two of them actually have a high precision. So the result is that I have a medium test result precision. The third key concept is to use conditional coring in all cases. I've gone into this in a lot of detail in the previous presentations, so I won't go into details here. 
And finally, the last key concept is to check how good our model is for the strength estimation. So once we've actually defined our model, which is, could be a linear regression, we actually have to check how accurate it is using the root mean square error, and we should check how good the prediction is, and I will give an example later. So depending on the estimation quality level that is required, the application of these key concepts is either recommended or mandatory. Another aim of the guideline was to reduce the number of cores required. So the guideline provides tables to determine the minimum number of cores required to achieve the specified estimation quality. In order to do this, we have to answer five questions. Firstly, what is the estimation quality level? What NDT technique are we using, rebound or UPV? What test result precision do we have? Do we want absolute or relative targets, so a percentage or a target in megapascals? And finally, is there any prior knowledge of the concrete properties? Here we can see an example of the tables for estimation quality level 2 for the rebound hammer. And we're looking at a test result precision 2 and absolute targets required. Here we can see the tables for high, medium and poor test result precision and you can clearly see how it affects the number of cores required. So it's well worth taking some time to concentrate on the NDT. Question 5 is about prior knowledge of the concrete. So it could be that we know that the main strength should not exceed 30 MPA. If we don't have any information about the coefficient of variation we take a high one. And in this case, we can say that a minimum of five cores are required. I'm going to apply this method to the raw data we've been using throughout this series, but we have to make some assumptions as this Rylem method was not used when collecting this data. So there's no information about the test result precision. And I've assumed a TRP2 for this. I've also assumed the mean strength should not exceed 30 MPA. And we've assumed that we have no information about the coefficient of variation of the concrete. As we saw from the tables, I need five cores and I've chosen them using conditional coring as close as I can. And I've used a simple linear regression as my model. So here we can see the mean strength for the test region calculated from the estimated strengths at locations where we don't have core information. And we can see the standard deviation 4.1. It's 0.1 over the requirement for the estimation quality level, but this is probably due to the fact that we don't have real uh, conditional coring here. In this case, we have core information at uh, several locations that were not used to generate the model. And we can use this to check the accuracy of the model. And you can see that all of the local strength estimates given by the regression are within the six megapascals, which is specified. And of course, the regression that we've created can be entered as a custom materials curve into the Schmidt app and then used to estimate the strength at any location in the test region. If I compare the results with the methods we've used earlier in this series, you will see that with the five cores, I've obtained the same mean strength as I did using all 12 cores in the EN13791 method. And in addition to that, I have the strength at any location in the test region with a guaranteed tolerance. So to summarize the RILEM method, it's applicable for existing structures. It provides a best estimate of the strength at any location with a specified tolerance. And it defines the minimum number of cores required to obtain the estimate.